This is Anabaptist Perspectives, and we are back to talk about money again. This series has presented some suspicion of things like interest, usury, as we talked about in the episode about economics and pre-modern Catholicism. But there's a positive vision or something that we can believe in rather than just critiquing abuses. Stephen Russell is with us again to talk about something called distributism. So introduce us to distributism. Well, the previous um, episode was about uh, Catholicism especially and its view of money. And um, this, this view called distributism also comes out of modern Catholicism. Distributism is something that arose at the end of the 1800s as um, Europe and the West in general started to um, experience some definitely harmful aspects of the Industrial Revolution. And uh, because of that, there was a lot of turmoil in the working uh, people, among the working people, and uh, out of that comes socialism and Marxism. Of course, uh, the, the thrust there is uh, revolution and destruction, destroy those that have, um, that have wealth and spread it out, redistribute it. That's not what distributism is about. Pope Leo XIII became quite aware of, of the problems. Uh, it's, it's probable that the fact that um, many, many, many years after the Industrial Revolution had already started, as the problems mount and, and the uh, workers start to get upset about their situation, that's probably what woke um, the Catholic Church up. And Leo XIII um, issued an a encyclical called Rerum Novarum, which is, means about new things. And so the point here was to say that um, the economy is, de is developing in a, in a certain way, and we need to think about new ways to help people uh, to, because, because right now things are going in a bad direction. Poor people are getting poorer, rich people are getting richer. And um, so anyway, he recognized this and um, he uh, stated that work is good and that people ought to be invested in their work. Now, his, at this point, that was mostly farming. And so one of, the, one of his points was, it's good for people to actually own their own land and, and provide for themselves, their families, and perhaps have extra so that they can uh, uh, sell that, the extra and, and buy other things that they might need. But the emphasis was, uh, work is good and um, we need to get people invested in their work and what they're doing and make it something that they can actually own and uh, be excited about. And then distributism sort of comes out of his uh, writing Rerum, uh, Rerum Novarum. It comes out of that, and uh, especially some uh, English Catholics started talking about how to do this, how to practically do this. Chesterton is one of them, and another man is a, uh, named Belloc. And um, I think it would be good to uh, talk about what, what their um, aim was in trying to develop this idea that Pope had talked about, that it's good for us to be invested in what we're doing, the kind of work we're doing, that, that it actually is something that, uh, you know, I can do this work and I can be proud of, proud of it, um, and, and I'm, I'm proud that I can take care of my family. Well, uh, these English Catholics uh, said that their focus should be on the family, not on individuals. This was uh, definitely the the modern world was moving towards a focus on the individual and it, the individual is important and they weren't denying that but the, the the unit the essential unit of society is the family and so something uh, the th something needs to be done that would strengthen the family and make it uh, sort of the the key aspect of society the point of distributism isn't redistributing wealth it is enabling people by, dis by, by somehow distributing the means of production, uh, helping each person to develop his skills, to develop the, the gifts God's given him. So if he's a farmer, help him, uh, 
have a farm and and uh, farm well. And uh, if he's a blacksmith, help him to get the tools he needs and get his little shop started. The best thing is when uh, the uh, the family, if possible, and maybe a little bit, the, maybe the extended family, if it needs to be a larger enterprise, uh, that 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 there's a focus there. The emphasis isn't on making a lot of money. The emphasis is on uh, helping each person to develop the skills that he has and to develop uh, other things. Like if I have um, a gifting to sing or to play an instrument, I should be able to produce enough that I have time for other things. I have time for people. I have time for uh, doing, uh, learning an instrument. I have time for reading things. I have time to go to church and actually help out there. Uh, so the, the, the focus is the individual, that the family, that people in general um, become what they can become. The emphasis is on small is good, small is beautiful. And let's uh, um, have each person become basically a craftsman, a, a person who can do well whatever, um, whatever it is that he feels uh, gifted in. Now, what I've talked about is, is uh, mostly family-sized businesses. Some things have to be bigger than that. It just has to be. So for instance, if you want to build trains, you need a company bigger than, I mean, I don't think you and your wife can build a train. And I can't build a Boeing 777. So there are companies that need to be bigger than that. Distributism would say the best way to do that is to have a co-op, have a company where at least as many as possible of the employees are actually, they have a, a part in that company. They actually own it to some degree. There is a particular example of this that I think is a, a really good thing to think about. In Spain, after World War II, there was a, um, the, the economy was not that good. And in Northern Spain, there was a priest who was concerned about this and he started to try to uh, practice uh, distributivist principles in a town called Mondragon. He started a company uh, called Mondragon because of the town. And th this is a fascinating story. I don't know exactly where they are today, but they started several different um, co-ops to do um, industrial work, to do financial work, to do um, retail work, and even educational work. The people that were, at least originally, that were part of the company were, in essence, holders of that company. They were co-op, they were in a co-op. And um, so they're huge nowadays. They, they have about 80,000 workers. They have um, factories in um, over 100 countries, I believe. I'm not quite sure if they've held on to all of their uh, ideals. As you get bigger, that's always a, po a problem. And um, some of the reading I've done sounds like uh, some people have felt that the original care um, that each person had for the other is, is missing maybe, maybe at least sometimes today. But the point is that we are in this together and, and that would mean things like, let's say if uh, my father was sick and I need to take care of him, if I'm one of the people that's a part owner of this co-op, I probably can get some time off, somebody will fill in for me, and later on I will fill in for somebody else. There's that kind of flexibility because I own it. I'm, part, I, I'm, I'm one of the people that owns it. All of the people that are, are part of the co-op make decisions together, at least as much as possible. And one of the fascinating ways they do this is they recognize that the, the uh, managerial staff has more responsibility and should be paid more. But it's the, it's, it's the people in that particular department that get together and decide what multiple of the incoming uh, salary for, or wage for a person coming into the company, what multiple of that does the, the person, the management at the top get? There are many departments under Mondragon, the Mondragon co uh, Cooperative uh, Company name, and each one of them will decide what, what multiple the um, management gets. It goes anywhere from three to nine. Hmm. Three times the entry or nine times the entry. And I think I read somewhere that 
uh, roughly five is the average for the all of the Mondragon departments. So it's a very different approach to to um, running a company, and it it uh, involves those people because of ownership and because of um, helping to make decisions. It involves it involves directly the people that work there. So it's more than just working there. I'm not working there for a salary. This is actually something that I own in the sense of I claim uh, that it's important to me. Mm -hmm. So distributism emphasizes family and what's local, but what you're describing here sounds like there might be principles that would also apply to larger companies. Yes, but even the larger company is going to be a co-op of some, of some sort, a mutual, a, a corporation or an organization where um, there's a, a mutual ownership and, and responsibility back and forth. Mm -hmm. So before I began to talk with you about economics, mm -hmm. I never heard of distributism. So I guess I'm wondering, is this really a thing? Like you mentioned Pope Leo, you mm -hmm. mentioned Chesterton, English Catholics, this company called Mondragon. Mm -hmm. But who takes this seriously? Is it really a codified economic theory or what could we direct our audience towards, towards like Good. the definitive definition of um, distributism. Well, Chesterton was a big um, uh, motivator f for this whole concept. And I would suggest reading his book, uh, What's Wrong with the World? That gives you some sense of, of what he thinks um, a, a well-functioning economy might look like, or actually society. It's broader than just uh, just the uh, the economy. He also has a, a a book was put together recently called The Hound of Distributism. So it's articles that he wrote. So those would be two two things one could look at and read. Um, there are people out there that are are writing about it today uh, from a modern perspective, how it could work in the modern world. Mondragon is an example of a large corporation that um, is functioning as a co-op, working together. There's one in northern um, Italy. I can't remember the name of that. There was a small um, group of artists and artisans in England that functioned for about 70 years. Uh, they had trouble passing on the vision. So from about um, 1920 to 19, I think it was 1989, it was called the Guild of St. Joseph and St. Dominic. And um, they lived, to, oh, I have a quote about... Um, uh, their motto. Let me see if I can find that. Men rich in virtue, studying beautiful, beautifulness, living in peace in their houses. It kind of expresses the whole thing. Living in virtue, looking for beauty, uh, producing beauty, um, living in your own home peacefully. And so there are people that have done it, but one of the key things is it's it can't be imposed by government. Now, I think government can perhaps provide a setting through the laws that makes it possible. But um, by and large, distributists would say, government can't do this. This has to be something that committed believers start to do one by one. I have some friends that live near Pittsburgh, and they purposefully look for um, small farmers that they can go to to get milk and eggs and other things. It's a little thing, but it's something. You know, it might cost a little more to go to the private farmer and, and get the milk there or get the eggs there. But there's actually something that you're encouraging that is uh, more important than maybe the extra money you're spending there. So, yeah, it it is. It is a thing. Um, Catholics are more aware of it probably than anybody else. Uh, I think that this is how. Most, Anabap most conservative Anabaptists actually approach life something like this. They care for the family. They care about the business and their skills that they have. Um, so there's the thing that I like about distributism is if we read about it and they have actually thought through why, we, why they're doing it and what some of the pitfalls are and how to um, do it well. And I think when we don't actually think consciously about intellectually why we should do this and how we should do it. I think we're, we're in danger of eventually losing it. So I'm, I'm suggesting let's look at distributism and see how it fits in with what we have traditionally tended to do 
and learn from it and maybe improve it and do better ourselves. This approach to economics, it really is something that has to be done individually or by family and, and being committed. And I think that, yeah, government can perhaps make it easier for those things to happen, but it, I'm a little nervous when it tries to become the motivator there. I don't think it's gonna work too well in the long run. I think maybe that's a crucial point because it sounds to me like at least some of the concerns that distributism is responding to are ones that the socialists also mm -hmm. want to respond mm -hmm. to. Mm -hmm. But what you said a bit earlier, I think is important in that distributism shouldn't be imposed by the state. Mm -hmm. And that would be a pretty clear distinction between it and socialism. And in some ways, other political theories also that try to demand that economics happen a certain way. Distributism is trying to, to take a path that's between the kind of laissez-faire capitalism that was uh, being experienced in the late 1800s and the, the state socialism that, the, that Marx and, and other people were starting to say is the solution to that problem. And um, this says that both of those are an accumulation of wealth and power in a few hands and that in, either, in any case, they're, that's wrong. It's dangerous. It brings bad results. And distributism is about the uh, things that develop wealth are, are distributed among many people and that uh, the wealth itself isn't all heaped up by just one person. To a large degree, it's an attempt to get us to recognize that our security isn't in heaping up a lot of wealth, that our security is, first of all, in God, but also in his people. Instead of a kind of cutthroat economic system where I, I'm trying to undersell you, uh, you know, to, to get as much uh, business as I can, distributism would actually say we should, we should kind of help each other. You know, we should, I'll, I will have my little farm here and I will um, provide food in this area, you'll provide food in another area. And we actually might end up helping each other rather than going after each other. We're trying to buy you. I'm, I'm not going to try and undersell you, and then you you go bankrupt. So then I buy your farm. That's why it can't be imposed imposed by the government. It, it's got to be something in here. There's one more thing I wanted to say. I mentioned Mondragon, mm -hmm. and a an American sociologist went to uh, see what's going on in that town in northern Spain, which is the hub of the of this corporation. And this is what she said. Her name is. Uh, Barbara Peters, and she teaches at Southampton College, which is a part of Long Island University. And she said, in Mondragon, I saw no signs of poverty. I saw no signs of extreme wealth. I saw people looking out for each other. It's a, care, it's a, it's a caring form of capitalism. So it is a kind of capitalism. People own their own things, but it's not the kind of capitalism that the, the emphasis is on, I need to heap up lots and lots and lots of money. I, I just think this is a, a marvelous uh, testimony from someone that I, I, I don't know what her religious belief would be but, uh, or her um, uh, views on economics, but as a sociologist, she's saying, this town is really strange. It's not quite what you'd expect. What does distributism have to offer to the entrepreneurs and employees who are listening to this? Well, what I just mentioned, which is... Um, if I am fully invested in my work because it fits the giftings that God has given me and it enables me in a good way to provide for those um, that I'm responsible for, and it also gives me an opening to do something for the community because my work uh, is going to at least be needed by somebody in the community. So it, it opens up this whole different approach where who I am and what I do is actually important instead of I work here to make a paycheck so that I can uh, go out on the weekend and have a wild time. So it's a totally different approach. So that's for the worker, but I think that fits for the, the owner too. Um, he's gonna have different kind of workers. If he's actually somehow engaged his workers in becoming part of his business. In other words, maybe owning something in it or maybe giving good bonuses at the end of the year. You know, I, I, I don't think there's any one way this has to be done. 
but I think he's going to the 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 owner of a business is going to have better employees, uh, pe people who are more uh, engaged and committed to what he is doing. And another thing is, the emphasis is not on becoming big. I mean, for some some things you need to be big, and Mondragon is an example of having a large company, but. Maybe an advantage to at least some employers would be that they could actually help someone else. Let's just say if someone is uh, working on construction, he has several construction crews. Um, maybe instead of adding more and more crews, he could um, help someone that ha he has seen has really good uh, potential to start his own construction company. And... Um, you know, it takes, he doesn't have to feel that pressure of figuring out um, what five crews are going to do or what 10 crews are going to do and what he's got to do with the government and all that. He can actually help others develop their giftings and um, he doesn't have to bear the weight of having this big, big company. Now, I'm not a businessman, so uh, maybe a businessman will howl and laugh at what I'm saying, but maybe, maybe there's some truth to it. Yeah. Well, both of us are employees and work for somebody else. So <laughs> the practical implications of this um, are a bit different for us. Yeah. Well, this sounds very compelling. Um, I should think about it more before I commit, but this sounds very compelling. <laughs> uh, before we end, can we um, mention again the resources that you spoke about? Two Chesterton books, right? Two Chester. One is uh, a book that he wrote called What's Wrong with the World? Mm hmm and the other one is a recent compilation of some of his essays on distributism, and I believe it's called The Hound of Distributism. So those would be two places to go to. Um, you can Google distributism, and you will find uh, some modern writers on it. If you have a Catholic neighbor, you might ask. They might, know, so they might be involved in trying to be distributist in how they do their shopping and, and how they do their work. Because they're, they're the people that I would say mostly are aware of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'll be in touch with you after this interview, and we'll find some links and put those in the show notes okay. so our audience will be able to look up these books and Good. resources. Good. Well, thank you so much for talking with us about distributism. Mm -hmm. I've enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for this episode. We invite you to join our monthly partner program. Monthly partners are key to the financial sustainability of Anabaptist perspectives. Partners also gain access to bonus content, including our exclusive podcast where we respond to audience questions and comments. Sign up at anabaptistperspectives.org. <laughs>